Good morning Year 5, um, it is Wednesday, we've had our day off yesterday. I do apologise for um, this little hair that's come to join us today, but nothing I can do because every time I put it down, it just comes back again. So he's with us now, he's staying. Um, we are at Chapter 7. Chapter 6 was full of quite a lot of drama. Goodness me. And um, Bess has made her way to Rayleigh's Walk and has finally found water. Um, so we're going to see what happens next. So this is chapter seven. All the anger inside me evaporated as he embraced me and then, putting his cloak around me, he led me back through the narrow doorway into his room. Dearest cousin, he said, you cannot know what joy it brings me to see you again. As he looked at me, his brow furrowed suddenly into a frown and a smile left his lips. Yet I dread to know why you have come. There is something in your eyes that tells me it's not just to see your friend Walter. Is it bad tidings you, that you bring me, cousin? Your grandmother? I shook my head. She's all right, I said. Then it needs must be the farm, said Walter. Has it happened so soon? My poor Bess. Have they taken the farm from you and your home too? I see from your face that I've hit the mark. How did you know? I asked. It's in the nature of spirit, cousin, he said. To, sp to be a spy, to eavesdrop. Many a time I sat with your mother and father in the kitchen as they tried to find a way out. I saw the papers, cousin. I read the letters from the bank and from the landlord. I thought this might happen in the end, and your mother thought so too. But your father is a fighter, and I thought matters might yet be put right. I hoped as he did that a good harvest might save him. Is there no hope at all? The sales today, I said. We've had to sell everything, even Sally. My friend Walter shook his head sadly and looked away. We're moving out tomorrow, I went on. We're going to live at Auntie Ellie's till we can find somewhere else. And he put his arms out and hugged me to him. You said it would be all right, I cried, burying his face, my face in his cloak. You said that if I believed it enough, then everything would turn out all right. And I did believe you, believe it, like you said, but nothing turned out all right. I felt him stiffen. Then his hands were on my shoulders and pushing me away from him. When I looked up, his face was smiling and his eyes shining with excitement. And so it shall be, chick, so it shall. I will meddle just once more in your world, but to better effect this time, I trust. I had a mind to do this before, but I did not dare for fear of blundering. But now I see I have no choice. He wiped my eyes with his cloak. Be sure, dear cousin, that all can, that can be done will be done to restore your family's fortune, and mine too. But it's too late, I said. I told you the sales today. It'll all be over by now. It's never too late, Walter replied, turning to go. We must make haste. I may not be able to restore your home and your farm, but I will have something else in mind that will all do almost as well. And in doing it, I may kill, t kill two birds with one stone. I pray you, cousin, bide here a few minutes for, the hit, for there is something that must be done before we leave. He laughed aloud, a triumphant, almost a vengeful laugh. I have thought of it often, but never before just cause your, had just cause or purpose. Now I have. Fortune may be fickle, but she can sometimes be sweet. Stay where you are, cousin, and I will return. And he was gone. I did not have long to wait. The Tories had seen now on Rayleigh's walk pass back through the room. They looked at me somewhat strangely, whispering to each other. It occurred to me then that they might have witnessed my sudden disappearance under Walter's cloak, and I smiled at the thought of what they must have seen. One of them looked as if they were going to talk to me, so I turned away and pretended to be engrossed in the view from the window. When I turned around a few minutes later, they were gone, and my friend Walter was back, a wicked twinkle in his eye. We should not tarry to, to here one moment longer, cousin, he said. I have taken the honey from the hive, the honeycomb itself, and would have thee far from here before it is discovered. I fear it may make them mad. Who? Why the bees, dear cousin, he said with a chuckle. He was talking in riddles again. What honey, and what bees? I asked. All in good time, dearest Bess. I promise you shall know I have done and all I intended to do, but this is not the time for explanations. All will be well, just believe it, all will be well. You said that once before, I said. Indeed I did, Cousin Bess, but sometimes faith needs a little encouragement and a belief in a helping hand, but no more of this. We must be gone. Plead on, chick, I shall follow. Make haste and be sure that I shall be with you all the way back to Devon, whether you see me or not. The ravens were still squabbling over the last pork pie on Tower Green as we came down the stairs of the bloody tower. A beef eater was removing an upturned ice cream cone from the railings where someone had stuck it. 
He was muttering to himself as we passed. Mucky pups, he said. Mucky pups. And that set me thinking about little Jim at home and how they would have been all worried sick about me. I should have left a note or something. I should have told Will. I should have told someone. I just never thought of it. It was already the worst day of their lives and I had to go and make it worse. And for what? A trip up to London to shout at my friend Walter about how he'd let me down and I hadn't even shouted to him and he wasn't going to let me down. He had something up his sleeve. That was all I knew. But I had no idea what it was and there was no time to ask him. Not now. What was I going to say when I got back? Sorry, mother. Sorry, father. Sorry, Will. I didn't mean to upset you, but I've got a ghost friend I went to see and he's sitting here right beside me. He says everything will be all right. He's come home to us, but I don't know. He's come to help us, but I don't know how. Didn't sound very convincing. No, I could tell them nothing. Only that I was sorry to have worried them and that I was coming home. I found the telephones on Paddington Station. Most of them didn't work, but I found one that did and put in my money. The telephone rang. Father answered. Cripes, Bess. Where the dickens have you been? You all right? Paddington Station. Paddington? I'm catching the next train home, Father, I said. I could hear him shouting to Mother that I was all right. She came to the telephone, her voice heavy with crying. I'm sorry, Mother, I said. I didn't mean to. I was upset. I just ran away. I had to. Doesn't matter, dear, she said. All that matters is you're safe and you're coming home. We'll meet you at the station. You frighten the life out of us, Bess. And then she began to laugh. I could hear Humph barking in the background. I could see it all. Will jumping up and down and Humph bounding around in his excitement. The pips went on the phone and we were cut off. I coughed as soon as I found an empty part of the carriage to be sure Walter was still there. And there he was, sitting beside me in the window seat, swamped in his black coat cloak. I fear you have very little faith in me, cousin, he whispered. I have not prom have I not promised I will not leave your side? And he lit up his pipe and sat back in his seat. When I looked again, he wasn't there. But he was, if you know what I mean. Of course, no one else could see the smoke, but they could smell it all right. And they did. I wasn't to know that I'd chosen the no-smoking seat, was I? I hadn't even thought to look. At the first stop, Reading, it was a lady got in and sat down opposite us. She kept coughing and wiping her eyes and eyeing at me angrily. So I held my nose and shrugged my shoulders. It wasn't long before she got up and moved away and we had the whole carriage to ourselves. Then the ticket collector came round. He must have been about seven foot tall. He sniffed the air deliberately. Are you on your own? he asked, taking my ticket. I nodded. Someone meeting you at the other end, are they? Yes, I said. That's all right then, said the ticket collector, sniffing again. Bit of a pong in here. I've had a complaint. Lady back there says you've been smoking. You've been smoking, have you? I shook my head. He handed me back my ticket. Bad for you, you know. Stunts your growth. Never had one in my life. And he was gone. It was dark by the time we got back to Exeter. They were all waiting on the platform. Mother, father, Will and little Jim. Mother and father hugged me so I could hardly breathe. And I think they cried a bit. Even father. Little Jim grabbed my nose and pulled it which made me screech. He had such sharp little nails. Will was the only one who didn't seem at all pleased to see me. He just looked at me coldly, and I could see that Father, although he was relieved to have me back, was angry und under it all and trying not to show it. Everyone's been out looking for you, he said, as we walked back to the platform. What were you thinking, going off like that? I told you, dear, said Mother. She was upset, weren't you, Bess? I nodded. I thought so, Mother went on. She just couldn't take it any more, could you, dear? I mean, there were times today when I would have gone and done the same thing myself, given half a chance. We didn't even know you were missing till after the sale. Tea time it was. To go running off like that without so much as... Father was getting into his stride, but Mother looked at him and stopped him before he got going. Never mind all that, dear, she said firmly. There's no real harm done. Not now she's back. But she got to know the trouble she's caused, Father insisted. I mean, we had the police out looking along the river bank. They put frogmen in the river. Will said you told him you were going fishing. We thought you'd fallen in and drowned. Sorry, I said. I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't. It was all those people, then Sally was going to be sold, and I just wanted to get away, that's all. We understand, dear, said Mother. I'm not so sure they will, said Father, nodding towards the ticket barrier. Two policemen were standing there. I recognised one of them as the same one who had come when Sally went missing. They were both looking hard at me as I came towards them. Neither looked very pleased to see me. And where have you been, young lady? said the one with the peaked cap, the one I'd seen before. London, I said. You've put a lot of people into a lot of trouble, you know that. I nodded and looked down at my feet because I didn't want to look him in the eye. I don't know why you went, but don't ever go off like that again. Do you hear me? Promise me now. 
promise, I said, and I meant it. I'll call off the search then, Mr Throckmorton. Thanks, said Father, shaking his hand. I'm sorry I've put you through so much trouble. Is that that's what we're here for, he said. All's well that ends well, eh? He borrowed another of Brand's favourite sayings. Will never said a word to me, not at the station and not in the Land Rover all the way home, but I sensed he was looking at me in the darkness, and it made me feel uncomfortable. I coughed four times, but with some relief I saw the dark shape of water appear beside him. We were back home in the kitchen before Will said a word to me. Mother had taken little Jim up to bed, and Father was taking Humph out for his walk as he always did last thing at night. At first there was a silence between us. Why didn't you tell me? Will said suddenly. I wouldn't have said anything. I know, I said. You didn't want me to come with you, did you? Will went on. He was hurt more than angry. It wasn't that, I said. I just wanted to be alone, that's all. And I've been thinking, he said. What about? That you wouldn't hardly go off like that unless you had a reason, and a good reason. It just doesn't make any sense. I told you, I wanted to be alone. You can be alone down by the river, said Will. You don't need to go all the way to London to be alone, do you? There's something you're not telling me, Bess. Mother came in at that moment, and it was just as well. It was obvious that Will didn't believe a word I'd said. Little Jim's fast asleep, Mother said. She put the kettle on the stove and sat down heavily. Well, there's a day I never want to have to live through again. Still, it's over now, and all we've got to do is clear up this mess tomorrow and we'll be gone. I want to be out of here as quick as possible now. Humph scratched open the back door and came bounding his nose into the ground. He dashed it straight through the kitchen, skidded in the hallway and thundered up the stairs. He'll wait, he'll wait, little Jim, said Mother. What's the matter with that dog, said Father, putting the torch down on the kitchen table. Didn't seem to want his walk and that's not like him at all. You could hear Humph sniffing along the passage upstairs. What the dickens is he after, said Father, looking at the ceiling. To know, I said, but I knew all right. Will was looking at me and then up at the ceiling and then back at me. He was frowning. I knew for sure where my friend Walter was. There was no need for me to cough. The clock on the mantelpiece piece struck twelve. Weather forecast, said Father. Always listen to the weather forecast last thing at night. Always have done. Not that it matters to me. Now, Not now that I'm a farmer no more. You'll always be a farmer, dear, Mother said, going over to him and putting an arm round him. It's in your blood. Something will turn up. You'll see. We had a good sale, didn't we? Better than we could have hoped for. We'll be all right. The radio whistled and hissed until Father found the station he was looking for. And here are the main headlines again tonight. I could hear Humph whining outside my room and scratching at the door. The voice of the radio faded in and out, but you could hear most of what was said. Police have confirmed tonight that one of the crown jewels is missing. One of the golden orbs, known as Queen Mary's Orb, has been stolen from the Tower of London. It is the first time that any of the crown jewels has been stolen. Police say there is no evidence of a break-in and no alarm was set off. Streets around the tower are still sealed off tonight. A police spokesman said it was clearly the work of experts. The crown jewels, seen by millions of visitors each year, are kept under the tightest possible electronic security. The orb is said to be worth well over £10 million. And now, here is the weather forecast. I didn't hear the weather forecast. My head was swimming and pound the pounding of my heart was so loud in my ears that I thought everyone must hear it. The honeycomb. So that was the honeycomb Walter was talking about in his riddle. It all fell into place a few si in a few sickening seconds. Who else but a ghost? Who else but my friend Walter could steal the crown jewels without setting off alarms, without breaking anything? And who had disappeared for a few minutes and left me alone in the bloody tower? And who had te talked of taking the honeycomb and now the angry bees would be if it was discovered? My friend Walter had done it. And he was upstairs in my bedroom now. And six to one, he had the golden orb from the crown jewels with him. Mother felt put a mug of tea in front of me and stirred in the sugar. I felt as if I was being drawn into it and you would, and would drown in a whirlpool of tea in front of my eyes. You all right, dear, said Mother, pushing the hair back from my forehead to feel it. You're very pale all of a sudden, and there's a cold sweat on you. Don't suppose you've had anything to eat all day, have you, dear? No, I said. Tired out, I shouldn't wonder, said Father, switching off the radio. Well, I'm blowed. Did you hear that? How the devil did they manage it? We went up there once years ago. Coach trip, remember? You were only a couple of months. You were there only a couple of months ago, weren't you, Bess? Weren't there with Auntie Ellie in the family gathering, didn't you? I managed to nod. I don't know if what they think they can do with it, though. Can hardly sell it, can they? I mean, someone will recognise it. Most famous jewels in the world, they are. Still, ten million quid. He whistled. What I couldn't do with a little of that just, 
just at the moment and they say and they say it pays to be honest oh well i declared not to look across at will for fear of catching his eye well Bess went up to london today will said perhaps she's brought it back with her and they all laughed at that i tried to laugh with them but i think it came out more like a groan we all went up to bed at the same time that night at the top of the stairs father kissed me on the forehead just like my friend walter and i don't think he's ever done that before it was almost worth running away. Tomorrow can only be better, he said. Humph came lolloping out of my bedroom. Find what you're looking for, Humph, said father. Now get downstairs. Humph looked at him and went soulfully downstairs, stopping to look back over his shoulder every few steps if there might be a reprieve. There wasn't. Tomorrow night we'll be at Auntie Ellie's and she won't let you sleep upstairs, that's for sure. Humph sighed and went. Will made as if to follow me into my room, but mother wouldn't let him. You can talk in the morning, she said. Bess is tired out. Anyway, the removal lorry will be here by seven o'clock. We've all got to be up early. Off to bed now. And Will obeyed. A bit too easily, I thought. My room was not my room anymore. All my hours had been packed away. There were no curtains at the windows, no pictures on the walls. Elephant was nowhere to be seen. There was a packing case where my chair had been, and screwed up newspaper and was scattered around all over the floor. I shut the door and coughed. My friend Walter was sitting propped up against the pillows on my bed. His legs crossed at the ankles. He was smiling triumphantly. He knew I was here, he said. That cur of yours sniffed me from head to toe and I had nothing to offer him except this. And he threw back his cloak. The golden orb lay on his lap, shining and glittering in the light of the bedside lamp. I had guessed right, so it was no real surprise to me. But all the same, I could not take my eyes off it. He held it out to me. It's yours, chick. Come, take it. It will not bite you. It was a perfect globe of gold and circled with bands of pearls and diamonds and rubies and sapphires and emeralds and many more stones I could not recognise. At the top of it was a small jewel-encrusted cross. I was about to touch it when I pulled back. You stole it, didn't you? I said. You stole it from the tower. It was on the radio. They're looking for it everywhere. You shouldn't have. I'm no thief, cousin, Walter protested, his voice rising with indignation. Is it stealing to take what is mine? Did I not tell you how I was robbed of everything that was rightfully mine? My lands, my castles, my jewels? He held up the golden orb in one hand. This bauble is but a trifle of what I'm owed. It's what's due to my family, to you. You are of my blood, and therefore it is yours by right. Take it. I have only taken back what is ours, and ours it shall remain. I tell you, cousin, I had more jewels on one of my shoes than there are in this trinket. Take it, for with it you can restore your family's fortune. But it belongs to the Queen. It belongs to you, Bess, he said, smiling. And if you will not take it, then you must catch it. And with that, he tossed it to me. I had no time to think about dropping it, which was just as well, because otherwise I would have almost certainly have done so. I can't catch or save my life. It was heavier than I expected. A lot heavier. Suddenly, the door behind me opened. I swung around, the golden orb in my hands. My brother Will was standing there, his mouth gaping. Gripes, he said the end of chapter seven we have to wait for chapter eight which i'll upload ready for friday's learning hope you are enjoying it and i'll see you soon bye